Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. I'm Dan alongside Matt, and we're here for another week of Flames hockey. And this is kind of an up and down week for the Flames a loss to our provincial rivals in Edmonton, and a big win against the St. Louis Blues. Matt, let's start at the top. Um, what did you think of this Edmonton game? Well, I thought uh, both games this week were fairly similar. The Flames completely dominated the Edmonton Oilers 5-on-5 five five and put up a lot of shots. I think they finished with 48 or 49 shots in the game. And it just came down to a little bit of lack of discipline in the second period and a couple of power play goals for the Edmonton Oilers. And then uh, the referees kind of missing an interference penalty uh, in the third period that led to uh, the game-winning goal. I don't think that the Flames played as bad in this one. I mean, you know, 5-3 to three sounds like, you know, the, the Flames let in a lot of goals. I think this is just a, I would say, a byproduct of going against two of the best scorers in the league. Yeah, like the, the first two goals that the Oilers scored were on the power play, and their power play is lethal, and that's why you have to avoid taking penalties at all costs against the Oilers. Like, if you keep them 5-on-5, five five, like, McDavid's not even that good 5-on-5. Five five. And, you know, like the whole team, like, if you're managing to keep them off the power play, you should win that game, like, 95% of the time because the Oilers are terrible other than the fact that they have a really good power play. And I, I think you're right. That's That was the Flames. If I have to look back at the Achilles heel of this one, I think the, the Flames gave up. I mean, they didn't give up much, but they gave a uh, few, I guess, one too many special teams opportunities. Yeah, and, you know, the, that, the game-winning goal uh, to me, like, that's just frustrating on a whole host of levels because of the fact that, frankly, like, Shillington would have cut Drysidle off and from where Dreisaitl was, he probably would have had a decent scoring chance or scored from where he was after beating Tanev. But the fact that he, uh, Shillington was tripped by Pugliarvi uh, and then nothing called, like, it, it just it baffles me sometimes when, like, game management instead of you know, calling obvious penalties, and, like, that was an obvious penalty. Um, like, you just can't trip a guy who doesn't even have the puck. Like, it, it's, you know, it, basic refereeing that, you know, like, and for that to lead to the game-winning goal, like, it's just, fr like, there are games like that that happen through the course of the season, and they do tend to even out over the course of a year. But it's just really frustrating, especially with the effort that the Flames gave, to have such a chintzy play end up being the game winner. The Flames, I thought, um, played better five on five, and like you said, I thought it was a it was a good game for the Flames. And yeah, it's too bad that that little bit of officiating, what should we call it, difficulty challenge, was what caught, maybe cost the Flames the game. Yeah, because it, it was clear, like, game management. Like, it, it was the final five minutes of the game. They didn't want to give the Flames a power play because they didn't want to give either team a power play that late in the game. And, you know, like, there was time and place when, you know, you, you call penalties and, like, even, like, regardless of situation. And, like, by the time Shillington got tripped, like, Tanev was already getting beat by the... Uh, dry sidle. So it's like it's clear that you know this incident away from the puck is going to directly impact the play. You know, it, it would be just like getting upset if somebody was tripped on a breakaway and they didn't call it. You know, like a trip or a penalty shot. Like it's like you just you know some things are just should be automatic. And for some reason, that one wasn't, and it burned the Flames in that one. Outside of that one moment, do you think it's fair to say in this one that the Flames didn't finish their opportunities and maybe need a little more killer instinct? Yeah, I agree. And, 
it, sometimes you have to buckle down and like the flames really did in the third period like they they definitely controlled that third even without scoring a goal they controlled the the pace of that third yeah and you know it, Credit to Koskinen. He did play his best game probably of the season. Um, but, you know, it, if you replay that game like ten times, the Flames probably win at nine. It's just... Yeah. It, it There's not really much that you can do when you give up a couple goals on the power play to the best power play in the NHL. And then that kind of a play happens... You know, it it's unfortunate, but and especially with the opponent, it's doubly unfortunate. But you know, things like that do happen, and the Flames just needed to respond from that performance with an even better one. For sure. Um, and on the better performance, I guess at the end of the game, Coach Daryl Sutter was asked if he thought the team took a step back when the with this game, and he said that he didn't. Um, and, and I think that's a fair criticism. I mean, yeah, it was a loss, but I think that when you look at the games around this one, um, you know, we, we've been playing, they, they played a pretty good game against Florida. Um, and then the next night it was a pretty good game. So I would agree with Daryl. I don't think the teams took a step back here. Yeah. It, it would be different if the flames were out shot or out chance in the game, but Basically, when it was five on five, the Flames completely controlled the play. Drysaddle and McDavid didn't really have any opportunities, and you know they did all that they needed to to win. It's just that it was one of those games where you do everything right and you still don't win. And Matt, you had commented um, in our previous show about sort of the emergence, and we both commented on um, how we're starting to see Sean Monahan looking better. And we'll talk about him in the St. Louis game, but in this Edmonton game, what'd you notice from Monahan? Uh, more of the same. Uh, he's looking more confident out there, um, more like himself. And I think that he needed time for his body to recover from that operation. Like it sometimes, like you're fit to play and then you're fit to play and like i think that like the flames sheltering him partially was that he i don't think that he was 100 percent to start the year but good enough to play and so hey let's try and get him to work on other aspects of his game while he gets better and you know now you're starting to see more of the monahan of old where like, he is that dynamic offensive threat at both ends of the ice. Like, he's increasingly looking good defensively and engaging a little bit more physically. It's starting to look like it's turning the corner for him. Yeah, no, I, I think you've you've hit everything I had down in my notes here about that game. I don't think there's anything else about Edmonton. Should we move on to the St. Louis game? Uh, Yeah, just one more thing. Those Oilers orange jerseys are just terrible. It, it has to be said. Like, it, they're just bad. You know, it, it's funny because there was, um, who was it, a couple years ago, and they for the second year they wore those jerseys, whatever year that was, uh, somebody actually did the math that I guess they were the slowest team in the league when wearing those jerseys. And it's like, well, they're true pylons. Yeah. I think it's one of the guys at Money or at, um, um, Money Puck that did it. Yeah. So. It- it, it's just one of those things that, like, yeah, the original Alberta Oilers jerseys were that color scheme, but, you know, like, it's also awful, and that's why it was ditched. You know, like, yeah. <laughs> well, and the orange, I think, is okay. Like, there's a lot of colors that are okay on a jersey as maybe an accent color. I think, like, Vegas, I wouldn't want to see them in that silvery or that uh, shiny gold every game, but I think it's a cool accent color. I think orange is a good accent color for those guys. Yeah. But I don't want to see the, the Oilers wearing orange as their primary uniform. No. Like, it's even okay if it was a third jersey, but it's not. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm trying to I'm trying to think of who else, um, you know, some of the teams, like Nashville, when they used to have those big yellow jerseys, the Predators. Like, yeah. you know, you, yellow is good in their scheme, but not something you want to be your, your primary color. Well, you know, the good thing with those jerseys is that if you're eating a hot dog and you spill some mustard on yourself, you don't notice. Well, it doesn't matter now. No one can buy food in the arenas. 
True. Um, you know, so I think, you know, even when we look at, um, you know, so I, I think it's, yeah, I'm just trying to think of teams that have had similar jerseys. I think the orange, what was it? The 2002 to like 2008, the uh, orange Islanders jersey, same thing. Yeah. I think Islanders work well with orange in their scheme, but yeah. not as their as their main color. Yeah. I know. It, or the yellow. Do you remember what it was? It was 2013 yellow or gold or whatever buffalo jerseys? Oh, yeah. Those awful monstrosities. Yeah. And they had, I think, silver numbers on the back. It was terrible to read. Yeah. Well, basically, Buffalo Sabres jerseys, other than their original or variants of their original, are all awful. Like, I, they have not come up with a single good other option. I I didn't mind the jerseys in the '90s when they had sort of the I didn't like the Buffalo head logo, but I liked the the sort of jersey around it. Yeah, like at the time, it was a very unique. It was sort of that um, almost like horn look to the stripes. I thought they had a unique striping pattern back then, but I didn't like the Buffalo head logo. Yeah, like it got rid of the whole saber piece. I know. It's like you're not the Buffalo Buffaloes, you know. Like, but we're not here to talk about Buffalo. Instead, we're here to talk about another team the Flames beat, and that's the St. Louis Blues, seven to one, seven to one on home ice. When was the last time you can remember seven goals scored by the Flames in forty minutes? Well, you know they want to get their homework done early so they could have a spare in the third period and call it a day. And that's the weird thing. Like they were doing so well, they averaged uh, four, thir- three goals in the first, four goals in the second, and none in the third. And that's when they changed goalies. And I think that was the reason why. I think if Bennington would have stayed in there, we could have got to double digits. Well, and uh, a lot of credit to Vili Huso. Like he played rather well in that third period. Like the, he he made some saves that like even an, a, an average goalie would have let in. I don't think the Flames let up their pressure. I just think the Vili Huso really shut the door. Yeah. Which, that's the game I'm looking forward to most this week. The other St. Louis game? Yep. I thought St. Louis looked really sluggish in this one, more so than I expected after back-to-back with Vancouver. Um, And, Matt, if my math is right, did we only allow two St. Louis shots all second period? Yeah. It it was quite an all right period. You know, we scored twice as many goals as they had shots. You know, it was weird in this one. I was sitting in the press box watching it. Tyler Bozak scores. Then the Flames open scoring from Nikita Zadorov. And I turned to the guy next to me and I said, wow, if Zadorov opens scoring, it's going to be a hot night for the Flames. And I didn't expect seven, but I thought if Zadorov's, you know, breaking the seal, everyone else is going to get a goal after that. That was just my hunch. Well, you even saw later in the game where uh, Erica Branson actually took the puck to the net and tried to deke out the goalie. The puck was chipped off his stick, but, you know, it's like, hey, well, if everybody else is doing it, I might as well try too. That's right. Um, Every flame has a point in this one except for Lucic, Richie, Dubé, and Mangiapane, which surprises me, um, Hannafin, and Shillington. Yeah. Speaking of Dubé, though, when I when I was sitting uh, after the game and making notes on this, I actually wrote down here the only Flames forward I didn't really see all night or didn't you know remember anything I guess positive from was Dubé. Like he he played a lot. He played fifteen oh nine of uh, total time on ice. He was on the power play. He was on shorthanded, but I just I didn't see much from him. He skated hard a few times, like with the puck and. Um... He had four shots on goal. Yeah. But I don't know. He's just, he was not noticeable that night. And um, he had more shots on goal than Mangiapane did. Yeah. Mangiapane's the, oh no, Mangiapane and Anderson, the only Flames with a minus on the night. Yeah. You know you're having a stellar night when it's a 7-1 game and you're the one and the minus. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Like, yay, I'm awesome. And I would, I will challenge any of our listeners to tell me if this is right. Um, I'm totally making this up. Well, I heard it. I heard Tori say it last night, Tori Wilson, and I did a little bit of research and couldn't find anyone to refute it. So I'm gonna run with it. 
I think that Matthew Kachuk and Keith Kachuk are the first father-son duo to get five points in a game each. I don't think there's been another fa- uh, father-son duo to, Gordy to do and, that. Gordy and Mark Howe. Both in the NHL? Because yep. we were trying to look it up after. Yeah. Okay. Both, All four of them had five assists in a game at one point. Okay. Because we looked it up and we found an IHL game. I think Droid Vipers would have happened, but we couldn't find an NHL game. Um, and, you know, to give credit to the Blues, I thought in the first period, Markstrom made some really good saves. Like, yeah. you know, the Blues were pushing at the beginning of the first period, and I thought that there were some really good saves that Markstrom had to make. Yeah. So... Really good game here. I mean, when you look at the Flames, Flames are up on every metric. 48 shots to 21 from the Blues, 60% faceoff wins, 2 of 5 on the power play, only 4 penalty minutes to the Blues, 10. And I thought that was the other thing here that got the Blues in trouble was just how much penalty time they took. Yeah. Well, and, like, with this game, uh, to me, it makes the next one later on in this week to be a very pivotal game to see... Uh, where the flames are at really you know because like when it comes time for the postseason like the your opponents are all going to be good for one and you know that they're going to have a, a greater sense of desperation the deeper into a series you go and you know the flames basically pants the blues in this game and they're going to be coming out throwing everything at Calgary uh, on Thursday and Calgary needs to you know like you saw that in the third period like St. Louis really did try to score at least a goal or two to save face and credit to Markstrom on those but you know I'm glad St. Louis got one I think this would have been a even worse if it was a 7 nothing shot I mean as a Flames fan you want that but good for them for at least getting one yeah and I think that, like, that next game, like, because you know that St. Louis is going to be throwing everything in the kitchen sink at Calgary to basically have a blowout the other way. And Calgary needs to figure out, A, how to weather that storm, and B, make the game theirs, even though St. Louis is going to throw everything at them. And, you know, it's interesting, I think, in... Um... It's interesting in that scenario. This one, St. Louis was coming on the back-to-back. They'd played Sunday, and then they played us on Monday. On Thursday's game, we're going into the back-to-back. So you're going to have each team kind of coming in with the same disadvantage in the other one's barn. Now, I, I mean, I don't expect a 7-1 win the, you know, the other way for the other guys, but I think it's... It's definitely something, like you said, where the Blues are going to have to sort of prove they can do this and prove they can beat the Flames. And I think the Flames are going to have to prove that they can do it twice. So I think it's going to be a game that's there's a lot of stakes on both sides. Yeah, and like you look earlier in the season, like the Flames uh, kicked the tar out of the New York Rangers, and then they played them again a week and a bit later, and then they did the same thing to the Rangers. And... You know, like, uh, New York hasn't really lost too many games at all this season, and yet, like, Calgary absolutely destroyed them in both. And it'll be interesting. Just looking back, that was a 5-1 Calgary win on the road and then a 6 nothing win at home. Yeah, it's one of those where, like, Calgary needs to show that uh, mental fortitude when it comes time to playing those elite teams. Because, especially in the postseason... Like, every game is going to be hard. Like, there's no, you know, and it was a lesson learned against Colorado a couple of years ago. Like, there are no easy teams, and you need to be prepared from puck drop, and even if you're up 3-1 in a series, you have to be able to finish them off. And Calgary needs to learn those lessons, and hopefully, you know, like having a precursor to that this week against St. Louis might help them build that internal confidence i'm i'm hoping you're right on that one i think it'll help with the confidence i think just that big win is going to help them hopefully roll into uh the next game and you know feel more ready this team has been on a, I, I think even with the wins they've had i i think it'd be fair to say and you correct me if you think differently matt but i think it's fair to say 
this team has been on a bit of a slump. They haven't been doing well since they got back from their COVID break. And uh, you wouldn't know it looking at this uh, Blues game. So I'm hoping they can use that to sort of ride the ride the wave, if you will, and, um, and you know, play that way. I mean, you're not going to get seven goals, but sort of have everybody pitching in and playing the way they did going forward. Yeah, and, like, this team needs contributions from everybody. And it was especially nice to see Adam Ruzicka tally a goal and provide some depth scoring and hopefully he gets a little bit more of a shot uh perhaps with some better line mates as well just to see uh, if he can find his niche on this team he was out there when he got his goal and around his goal with uh Goudreau and Kachuk and I mean even on that Rajiska goal Johnny really set that up and there was a few times there right around his goal where they were trying to set Adam up for a goal so you know, I mean, again, good for those players to say, hey, this guy needs it. Let's, you know, get the kids some confidence. And there's a few times I thought they did a really good job of setting Adam up for a shot. Yeah, and it's a little bit of A and a little bit of B. Like, uh, Rajitsko was in good position in the offensive zone, I thought, for a good portion of the game. So, you know, it, it'll be interesting to see where exactly he f- finds himself in the lineup and whether... Uh, he'll contribute as a fourth line, uh, 13th forward type guy, or if he can establish himself as a quality middle six guy. Well, and I think if he's a centerman, there's really no room this year, at least on the middle six. So I think this year he's destined to be your, your either fourth line or extra forward. I mean, you're not surpassing Monaghan or Backlund at center. True. Right. So I think he's kind of destined to be fourth line this year and maybe next year that maybe the team feels a little more, you know, likely to move Monahan the off season if they like what they're seeing from Rajishka. Yeah, I can see that. So Justin Falk didn't want to come to Canada and now he's leaving Canada. Um, probably wishing that he didn't ha- end up coming, but yet the flames end up dropping the second of two battles of Alberta to Edmonton. So with both those things in mind, Flames now sit 8th in the West and 4th in the Pacific Division. They have 44 points, tied with San Jose, 37 games played, 19 wins, 12 losses, 6 overtime losses. The only teams above us, LA at 48, Anaheim at 49, Vegas at 52. When I looked at this season going into it, I did not expect that LA and Anaheim would be ahead of us. No, and frankly, if you look at like the amount of games played... That's true. Like, uh, Calgary, I think, is, like, only four and five points behind, and yet to have, like, six or seven games in hand on each of those teams. Yeah, we're 37 games played, and uh, LA's 43, and, they're, and we're four points down on them. So, like, by the time we catch up in terms of games played uh, to the 43 mark, the Flames realistically should be ahead, barring, yeah. like, weird BS, so... Yeah, it's just one of those things that uh, the Flames just need to keep taking care of their business and see where things lie at the end of it. I don't disagree, but it's nice to see them sort of back in a quote-unquote playoff spot. True. Uh, that's That was what I was hoping to see there. That was, yeah, that, that was, you know, coming out of this week, I just wanted to see them get some points, and I think I was hoping for at least one against Edmonton, we didn't get that, um, but I I did um, I did see what I wanted out of that Edmonton game. I guess the best way to say it is, you and I said they were a good five on five team. Yeah, it, and like between the Florida game last week and these two, it reminded me more of what the October November Flames. So they just need to keep it up, and they should be able to carry on this week especially with two lesser opponents so you know it'll be interesting to see how things fare with that in mind i think we can start looking and you mentioned adam rajichka as you know where is he going to fit in the lineup here and you and i have had some discussions in the past about um 
who would be the best call up in what situation? Should we bring up, you know, Jacob Peltier? Do we bring up Connor Zari? Who do we bring up when? And I, I had a list here that was actually put on Flames Nation by a friend of the show, Ryan Pike. And I think Ryan really breaks this down well, that you've got to bring up the right guy for the right scenario, which I've been trumpeting since we started doing this show. You can't just bring up Jacob Peltier the moment you have a, you know, an injury. You've got to bring up the right guy to fit that need. So, Matt, I'm going to go through this list here from Ryan Pike. You tell me in each one of these if you think Ryan has the right guy in that position or if there's someone else you'd put in there, and I'll do the same. Yeah, sure. If one of your checking wingers goes down, Walker Dewar's probably the guy you bring up. Yeah, you need the big body physical guy more yeah, than anything. I, exactly. I totally agree with that. If a checking center goes down, Glenn Godin is the, the right guy. Yep. Yeah, and I would agree with that too. I'd say not even checking center, but I think if you lose your – uh, third or fourth center. If you lose, say, Monahan or Rajishka, then I think God ends next in line. If a middle six center goes down, well, you've already got Rajishka, so he's probably the guy that you just bring up, and maybe at that point it's God Ann who, you know, fills in, or I think we've got enough other bodies, but I think if a middle six guy goes down, you've already got that player on the roster. Yeah. Um, if a middle six winger goes down, you're either going to see Matthew Phillips or Jacob Peltier. Yeah, and I think that you'd probably see Peltier first just due to him b being physically bigger and with more points than Phillips. Yeah, the only reason I maybe would bring up Phillips is Phillips is older. You want to see what you've got there. I mean, I think he's kind of at that point where you either bring him up or you move on from him. And I think when a guy like Peltier is on a roll, you might not want to disturb that either. We've also seen in the past really good chemistry between uh, Phillips and Dubé. Maybe you bring them up and try those two together. Yeah, and it with all of these options, it allows for the current lines to be swapped up and down and all around to see if there's any chemistry. Because like you could bring up, say, Peltier, and he might just have perfect chemistry with Monaghan, per se. And, you know, if that happens, then that's awesome, and now you've got a good pairing one way or the other you just gotta find something to do with the guy who's hurt when he comes back yeah well off to the fourth line you go if a left shot defender goes down Valamaki or Mackey comes up and I think in, in that case Valamaki's your uh, your number one guy I don't think you would call up Connor Mackey before you so Valamaki I mean, Valimaki's the guy that started here. Valimaki's sort of, I think, the next, you know, NHL-ready guy. I think they're going to give Valimaki as much time as they can up here. Oh, definitely. Like, I think that by the time Valley gets recalled, like, he's up here to stay. Um, and then if a right shot defender goes down, it would be Michael Stone. So, again, they would probably bring up whatever AHL defender's hot at that point to play in the seventh slot. And I think like Rajishka there, I think Ryan's right that we've got that guy internally. If a goalie goes down, I think, you know, there's only one choice. And Ryan has the same guy here and it's Dustin Wolf. There's, you're, yeah. you're not going to be, you're not going to be looking at any of your other goaltenders there. Yeah, definitely. And Adam Wolf has, Werner doesn't come up. No. And Wolf's played exceptionally well in Stockton. So like there's literally no complaints. And frankly, he's getting to the point where he's ready for a call up anyway. Well, and he was up here for a while in the taxi squad, I think. Yeah, but I mean, like, basically like a quasi-1B type. Yeah, but you can't, just, you can't just bring him up without a guy being out somehow. Oh, I know. We've got too many bodies to just carry a third goalie. So, uh, you know, I think those are, again, those come from Ryan Pike uh, over at Flames Nation, but I think a good sort of idea of who you'd bring up when and that you can't just call up your top guy every time there's a there's a guy that goes down. you got to bring up the right guys at the right time, and I think you're often projecting outwards too. I mean, a Walker Dewar, Glenn Godden, those guys have a bottom six upside, so you're bringing them up because they're used to playing those, or those are the minutes you'd expect them to play. If you bring up a guy like Peltier is used to playing first-line minutes, stick him on the fourth line, you're not going to really be able to evaluate him because he's playing a very different role than he's used to. I agree wholeheartedly, and players need to be put in a uh, position where they can succeed with what opportunities they're given, and part of that is on the coaching staff for not recognizing that, oh, like, uh, this player, 
like say Phillips is not getting utilized because you know he's on a line with Richie and say Lucic like that's just not an effective use of Phillips talents because those two aren't necessarily going to play the game in the same manner and certainly the size discrepancy hurts especially the efforts to cr- like crash and bang and such yeah and I mean I think that you know when we're looking at who's on the roster and who's not Daryl Sutter um you know Trilliving, whoever it was we don't know went with a more veteran team this year and you can see that throughout the roster you can see that for you know the forwards the defense all sort of the extra guys they brought in it's a very veteran laden team and you know maybe next year we can prove that we need to add more youth instead maybe when we get rid of guys like brad richards you know you're bringing in instead of matthew phillips but and we could sit here and argue it all day, but the fact is the team went with Brad Richardson. They went with Trevor Lewis. They went with, you know, a more veteran team, um, you know, an Eric Good Branson. And it didn't leave as much room this year anyways for some of those younger players. Well, and to be frank, at the beginning of the season, the Flames were having depth issues where those guys all walked on and played well enough. So it's, as you've said repeatedly, you know, point to so-and-so and and, well you just have to be better than him and uh with how the kids are being used like they need to be able to be put in a position where they can be successful to go and take those spots and like if like say how Rajitska's played when he has if he can carry that on then like I could see him becoming a staple on this team even like right now moving forward And I think with the cap only going up a million bucks next year is not even be better than him. I think in some cases it's be cheaper than him. And I think you're going to see guys who maybe we wouldn't have looked at as um, an NHL or or a top 13 player get a shot for a year or two because they're cheap. And I think you're going to see not just on the flames, more guys come from the HL. I mean, I can even see a Justin Kirkland or a guy like that who, you know, Byron Ferozzi, who we have in the HL, who, you know what, you're going to be 13 because you're less than 900,000. And as soon as you get to the 900,000 mark, away you go and we'll find someone else. Yep. So I, I think that bottom, let's call it the bottom four forwards. I think you're, you know, bottom three and then you're extra, or maybe your bottom five forwards if you carry an extra two and your bottom three defensemen. I think it's going to be interesting to see who holds those positions over the next couple of years. Well, while we're talking about salary and, you know, who's who might hold those and who's cheap, Matt, the Flames have four big contracts coming up at the end of this year that we haven't really talked about yet. And as we're, you know, in the new year and starting to probably think about how much money we're going to need for each of those deals, I thought it'd be a good idea to, for the first time, maybe have a discussion around the four big contracts the Flames have. Goudreau, Kachuk, Mangiapane, and Shillington this summer, and what you think each one of those deals is going to look like, and we'll both share our thoughts there. Let's start at the top. Johnny Goudreau, probably the guy poised to make the most. What do you think that deal is going to look like? Seven or eight years, nine, nine and a half. You think seven or eight years, really? Yep. Well, uh, he's 28 now, so I'm figuring that he's going to want to like cash out for the rest of his career, because like if he takes like a two- or three-year deal it's hard for him to play at that elite level. And like we saw with uh, Daniel Briere, who's a similar ish player in stature, he kind of fell off the cliff at one point and you know, Goudreau uh, because of his size could possibly have that happen. And if that's the case, like I think he's going to want to make sure that he's covered and then some. Yeah, I can see that. I just don't know the team's going to want to commit that much money for that long on a 28 year old true but uh cost of doing business as well so it like yeah, it's not ideal business, but also in a in a what could be a couple flat cap years i don't know i well, don't know that's a tough one yeah it also depends largely on well frankly how the flames do the rest of the season like if say like the flames flounder in the playoffs again then like Perhaps it's a good idea to move away from Gaudreau fully anyway and, you know, shake things up at that point. 
it's too bad the NHL doesn't have player option years. Like when I look at a Goudreau contract, I think that would be the perfect contract for the Flames to put a player and a team option on. I would do six years with a player and a team at the end of that. And, you know, then when he gets to 34, if he's still worth it, you yeah. could give him those option years. So it's too bad the NHL doesn't have those. But I'm going to go seven years, nine and a half million on this one. Yeah. So we're basically the same. Just I think I was going to say six, but I think the Flames and I think Goudreau is going to ask for that extra year. Now, nine, five, we'll say is the average. We're not going to go year by year on these, but I think that's a prime contract to get front loaded on. Yep. I agree. So, so nine point five for Matthew Goudreau. What do you think for Matthew Kud- or for Johnny Goudreau? What do you think for Matthew Kachuk? Uh, probably in the neighborhood of six or seven years at eight million dollars if he wants to stay. If he's kind of like getting ready to walk as a UFA, I think his contract will be like the amount of years necessary specifically so he can walk. Do you think they get him to free agency and that's it? Yeah, like, it depends on what Matthew wants. Like, if he's looking to cash in, I think the Flames are more than happy to go to town for him. But it's uh, hard when, you know, like, especially with that last contract negotiation being a little more difficult, uh, he might just want to get quickly through in order to go play where he wants to if he does want to play somewhere else. See, and that's interesting that you're saying, you know, long-term on this one. I'm of mixed opinions. I think Matthew didn't have a great season last year. He's having a good season this year. Do you pay him on the good or do you sort of penalize him for the bad? I'm almost wondering if they do a one- or two-year deal as a show-me deal on this one. Give him $9 million or 85 or maybe a little bit more than he might be worth on a one- or two-year deal and let him and the team figure out what the future is. Like, what, what would you think about a one- or two-year deal? Do you think that's feasible there? Well, I think that would be, like, um, more of a training camp type thing. Like, if Kajuk's holding out and, like, they're just too far apart on a longer term. Because I think the Flames, like, priority number one, two, and three is to get Kachuk signed long term. So that's where, like, I'm kind of thinking that perhaps... You know, like if it ends up like a one or two year deal, it's because the negotiations have kind of gone awry, I think. So you're thinking if it's a one year deal, they're almost signing to keep them, but they're going to be looking for a buyer right away. Yeah. Like I, I would like if he's not signed long term, I think you're likely going to start to see the Flames entertain the idea of like tearing down a bit. Like, I'm still not sure what he is. Is he a playmaker? Is he more of a physical forward? Is he more of a power forward? Like, I'm not quite sure what he is, and I'm wondering, that's what I'm thinking, maybe one or two is too short, but I don't know if it's a six. Maybe it's a two- or three-year deal. Like, I'm thinking this might sort of be his big money bridge deal. Yeah, it's one of those where, like, as you were describing all of the attributes, I'd say, yes, yes, he is. Because he's kind of like a little bit. Is of he a left winger? Is he a right winger? Like I still don't know that we know what we have with this player. Yeah, he's all over the place, and he is agitating everybody, which that's a good thing. So you know, he hits you on the score sheet and in you know sending you to the penalty box. So it works. It's just you know hard to tell right now based off of information available. I guess the other question there is, well, and it'll be a down the road problem, but I mean, if you're re-signing him for nine million, let's say, or eight and a half, you're signing Johnny for about nine and a half. You've got only a couple of years left. I guess you've got, uh, oh no, you got a lot. No, you got um, one, two, three years left on the Lindholm deal. So at that point, you're gonna have to match the same contract if you're still your number one center. So it buys you a couple of years, but eventually, how's your top line center gonna feel if he's making half of what both of his line mates are? Well, it's one of those things that at the time Lindholm wasn't a first line center. And, that's true. You know, he's emerged as one, but you know that, that's one of those. Well, good for him. That's awesome. But you know, just unfortunate with how the CBA is that you know both teams and players can't renegotiate things after the fact. If the Flames have to move one of those two. Do you think that they would want to move on from Johnny Goudreau or Matthew Kachuk if they could only re-sign one? 
I, I would move on from Gaudreau if I had the choice. Interesting. I probably would as well. I think Kachuk's younger um, by four years. I think Kachuk has more things that you can't find in a top line player as easily. I think that, yeah, I would, I would keep Matthew Kachuk. Yeah. The next guy on the list is um, Andrew Mangiapane. Currently, he's 25 in the last year of his RFA deal, making $2.4 million. What would you look at as a deal for Mangiapane? I think with uh, Eat Bread, you're looking at more of a... I, I want to say, like, almost like a bridge deal again. Like, uh, ideally... Like a two or three year? Yeah, because it, it's hard because of the fact that like he's we don't know really what he is like even with his amazing start to the season there's been no consistency from you know like all of his goals except for one have been on the road and like he hasn't scored in a while like is he just a good second third line guy who had a heck of a hot streak for two months or is there more there there and, and I think looking at the roster, he's never, I mean, not never, in the next two, three years, if Goudreau and Kachuk stay, he's not moving up the lineup. Not really, no. Like, he'll plateau as the second line forward at that point. On this roster, yeah. Yeah. So two years, what do you think money-wise? I, I would go two years on a deal. I think three might be a little much. I, like, uh, I, I wouldn't double what he's making now would be five. I don't think you can double what he's making with the production he's got. No, I think four is like the uppermost, and I'd want like a UFA year or two bought with that extra bit. For Mo yeah, if, yeah, he's 25, so he's eligible for UFA at what, 20? I think he's, he's eligible about 28. So I think if I was going to do Monjapani, I'd be looking about two years, three and a half. I think you could give him maybe another million dollars because he is on your second line. And he is, you know, when he's on, he's good. But I wouldn't, I, I'd even hesitate to go to four. Yeah, I can see that. Like, I, it, I think, it's hard. It's hard because of the fact that, like, there's just not enough information. Like, because, yeah, he does have all those goals, but they were all on the road all in the early part of the season. And, like, the offense has dried up entirely since then. So it's one of those, it's hard for. I, I just think that no matter what he becomes, he's not going to regress in three years. I think even at three and a half, he's a good enough player in the lineup that if he's not scoring, he can do other things well. And I don't think you'll regret in three years paying him three and a half million. No. I think you might regret paying him four. I think you definitely regret doubling him to five. Yeah. It, it's if, hard to tell at this I point. I mean, even if, you know, Lucic is out of the lineup at his $6 million, even if eventually Mangiapane ended up being a third-line winger, I think you could afford, you know, his three and a half if he's playing with two guys at league minimum. Yeah, I agree. And the last name on this list, and probably the most intriguing, or at least to me, is Oliver Shillington, 24 years old, currently making league minimum as an RFA, having a great season, but really his first really good season. So again, do you pay him on the one season? Are you locking this guy up long term? I'll give you my thought on this first. I think the Flames go one year, no more than three million. I was gonna say one year, like maybe two, two and a quarter. Yeah, because it's like, okay, great, you played this well, we've more than doubled your money. Go do that again if you want yep. more. And well, and if we look at the hierarchy of contracts, I mean, Hannafin's making almost five. Anderson's making four and a half. Tanev's making four and a half. Right now, good Branson's one nine. So, yeah, I think two two would be reasonable. Yeah. Even, like, 2.75 would be fine. Like, it, it just, you know, on a one-year deal because, yeah. you know, being one I, year. I really... Hannafin or yeah, Shillington's a guy who I really need to see another good season from before I give him term. And to his credit, like his defensive game has improved significantly, even though he still has some lapses at times. For sure. But I almost, I don't know. It's almost to me too good to be true that he went from last year to this year. Like show me you can do it again. 
I don't want to shell out. I'll, I'll shell out big money for this guy if he can keep doing it. Yeah, like it's if you, yeah, like if you fast forward a year and he's repeated himself, then give him Anderson's contract. Yeah, yeah, and then you've got your top four at that point of you know Hannafin, Anderson, Tanev, and Shillington, and three of them would be under twenty six. Yeah, in which case you're under. basically set until you can draft some more guys and properly develop them in the farm and. Yeah, and, or and, even and. just start, or just start filling with uh, veterans. Like it's, you know, I think you need you need vets in your lineup. And I don't know that I would call, even though Hannafin's been around forever, I don't know that him and and Anderson are the veterans necessarily. I think you always, especially on the blue line, I think you need one grizzled vet. Yeah, and I guess that's where Tanev comes in. But well, we'll see how things shake out. It's increasingly more interesting as time goes on as we're getting more and more information about all the other particulars for the upcoming ufa season i think those are really the only real interesting contracts here i mean i think the other big ones are not going to come back let's just run through them quickly um tyler pitlick 175 i don't think he's back no. Brett Ritchie, 900. I think they might bring him back because Sutter likes him, but he doesn't get much of a raise. It's 900 again. Um, Adam Ruzhishka is an RFA. He's making 800,000. I think you just offer him as qualifier, and he would accept it. Uh, Trevor Lewis at 800, I don't think comes back. Brad Richardson at 800, I don't think comes back. Nikita Zadorov at 3.75, I don't think is back. Maybe Eric Goodbranson, but he'd have to take a pay cut. I could see the team want to bring him back as a vet, but not at $2 million when they're signing some big money deals up front. I agree. And the big question, do they bring Michael Stone back for another year? Oh, of what? You can't get rid of him. him. That's just not a thing. You know, he'll be back. Do you, remember in, do you remember the movie Office Space, the guy who didn't work there but still came to work? It's going to be like 10 years from now. Stone's not signed, but he's sitting in the press box and coming to practice. Are we still paying Michael? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, we are. And we will be forever because he never goes anywhere. He's ours. He's, that's right. He's the, 31. The curse of Michael Stone. <laughs> Just when you thought you were free. No, he's back. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think, you know, that's another one um, that's, that, that's another one that is, um, yeah, I, I'd be okay if they bring him back. I mean, it's 750000 why not as a number seven? I don't want Connor Mackey or Valamaki or someone being a number seven. So I think he's as good as any at number seven. And he's shown that he can do it when no one else can, when he hasn't played for a month. No, and frankly, like any playoff team needs eight or nine or ten defensemen just because injuries do happen, especially as the games get more physical in the playoffs. And you need to be able to have reliable guys that you can plug in the lineup to play 10 12 minutes in a playoff game if necessary and stone uh definitely fits that criteria and hopefully um we can utilize him at some point uh during this year and i would be somewhat surprised if he's not back yeah and you know let's be honest the flames have been fortunate so far i'm gonna knock on wood as i say this flames have been fortunate so far on the injury front and i think that you know they they can't keep going as well as they have been with major injuries so i think at some point even if it's just for a week someone on the blue line is going to be out and stone's going to be in yeah you know you're, you're not going to go the rest of the season as healthy as you have been no and it's one thing like if it's a game or two then you know it makes sense to go that route and if it's a longer term thing then i think val Mackey or Mackey gets the call yeah i think it depends on how long as well i, I mean yeah well it depends on how well i think it also depends on how stockton's doing where in the season it is if stockton's looking for a playoff berth or you know, they might want to keep those guys down there, which I think Stockton's number one in their division right now. So I, I think there's, it, it, I think it's harder to pull a guy up from Stockton when they're doing well than when they're, you know, a marginal team and it doesn't matter if their guy is there. I agree. So the only other thing I had on my list this week is the list of former Flames going to the Olympics. As we know, the NHL is not going to be in the Olympics this year, and there and but yet there's a lot of former Flames that are going to be at the Olympics. Well, you see, one thing that Calgary's always been good at is finding the best of the best of the really mediocre players. 
Enter Daniel Kachuk. Yeah. Rico Fata. Um, but it's it's fascinating that the Flames have someone on almost every roster. Let me go through these with you, and you can tell me how many of these names you remember. On Team Canada, on the forward side, is Corbin Knight. Yep. He played nine games for the Flames and registered a single goal, but he was more productive in the AHL, playing 92 games for Abbotsford, netting 26 goals. Yeah. Um, on on his team will also be Ben Street. Oh, yes. Free the 13-14 the, uh, season, I do believe, or 12-13. Uh, he played yeah. briefly. Yeah, his highlight, um, 19 games for the Flames, registered two assists in two seasons, but he was really good in the AHL where he netted 60 points in 58 games. Yeah. Did he not uh, go on to Colorado for a bit after and play? That sounds for- about right. I don't have his bio in front of me, but that sounds about right. Yeah. Um, and then you know and love him, Tyler Walderspoon. Oh, yes. We could have had Kucherov, but instead. Not, not Nikita Kucherov. Um Walterspoon's the biggest Flames veteran on Team Canada, playing 30 games in the NHL and far more in the WHL. Yeah. Um, he was he was like Walterspoon's claim to fame is like the constant tweener. He was always on the verge of making the roster, but could never really make it. Yeah. And if we had just gone with, you know, Kucherov, who was selected next, uh you know, though, there's so many times in Flames history we could say that we took Kid over Brodeur. Like, there's there's lots of times we could, you know, we could look back. And I think every team can. Oh, I know. After failing to get a qualifying offer from the Flames, Walterspoon jumped around the AHL and currently plays in Utica. So, I guess Utica's loaning him out for the Olympics. And one more Flames draft pick that... Um, that's going to go is, and he's going to be on the taxi squad. I guess they're doing taxi squads for the Olympics. Um, is John Gilmore. I think he was a college player. Yeah. He was a defenseman um, teammate of, uh, Gillies yeah. and Jankowski played. That's right. Yeah. Went and played for the Rangers for a bit. That's right. Yeah. Um, two former flames on team USA. One, he's most notable, not for what he did on the ice, but who we had to give up to get him. Kenny Agostino going to be playing for team USA. Oh, I, I don't remember who we had to trade for him. Hmm. I think his number might have got retired or something. I don't know. Joe Newendike? Maybe. Oh, no, he's not retired. He's forever aflame. So we've got, what, Al McKinnis then? Yeah. <laughs> um. He Agostino played only 10 games for the Flames over a few seasons. He was, again, one of those guys, I think, like Walderspoon, too good for the AHL in a lot of ways, but not you good know, enough for the NHL. You know it's bad when, like, one of my uh, memories from the early part of our doing the show was there was one week where it, I do believe he scored his first NHL goal, and, like, that was the only positive thing that we had to say that week. <laughs> so... Yeah. It's tough being a Flames fan, Matt. It's tough. <laughs> yeah, especially it was the 13-14 season, so, like, it was... R- remember that one, kid. Yeah. It's your only one. Yeah. Um. So, if anyone doesn't know who he was traded for, he was part of the package. And, actually, I think we'll talk about the other guy as well in a little bit, but... Uh, oh, no, we won't. Um. He didn't make it, but uh, he came over in the Jerome McGinley trade. Yeah. I thought Ben Hanowski was in here as well, but he's not. Yeah. Um, and then the other guys, Nick Shore, was also named to Team USA. He played nine games for the Flames in in 18, um, and he was traded from the Senators to our team in 17, 18. I don't even remember what we gave up for him. but I think it was a sixth or a seventh, something like that. Would like that would seem about right. So yeah. came from the Senators, paid less than Lazar. Yeah. It's one of those things where it's like, uh, which Shore are you talking about? Because I think we've had every one of them. <laughs> Got to collect them all. All the yeah. Sutters, all the Shores, got to collect them all. Yeah. Um, and then another hockey family, another former flame where there's more than one, and we all know the famous meme, what? There's more than one Granlin from uh, from uh, Vancouver, and that's former flame Marcus Granlin playing for Finland. He was a second-round player in 2011 for the Flames. He played three seasons here, also went to Vancouver and Edmonton before heading overseas, and is currently playing in the KHL. 
Um, Granlund was again, one of those guys that was good enough, I think to be in the bottom, uh, bottom six on this team. And I think could probably still be in someone's bottom six in the NHL. Well, you know, having to play for Edmonton, that's enough to make anybody scared him away. Yeah. It's like, I'd rather go to Russia, you know, send me to Siberia, please. Anything that's better right. than this. <laughs> Call the agent, take any deal except for this one. Yep. Um, and then the Swedish men's team has two former Flames, one who played for us last year, which was uh, Joachim Nordstrom, who played 44 games last year, and Oscar Fantenberg, who played 15 games for us in 18-19. So neither one all that memorable. I, I don't even – I mean, Joachim, Joachim Nordstrom was one of those guys you and I scratched our head is, why is he here? So uh, he, he two, was friends, two quick in and outs. He was friends of Markstrom and Lindholm, so it's like, hey, bring our buddy aboard. Okay, fine. Uh, and Fattenberg, I think, was uh, he was one of Sutter's famous uh, defensive depth trade deadline signings or trade deadline trades, wasn't he? Yeah. Uh, and, you know, Fattenberg didn't play poorly. It's just, you know, he was there, and the team then fell on its face, and then that was it. So it's like, yeah, okay, woo. <laughs> uh, two Flames playing for, what are they called now, the Russian olympic committee i think roc uh um yeah i think it's olympic athletes um from russia or just, something let's like just that. go the yeah. prince way the 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 athletes formerly known as russia yeah um pavel karnikov a fifth round draft pick from the flames in 2015 who never played for the team i don't even think he ever came over like i don't think he's oh, no, he was camp or anything yeah he was um was he we, we actually you and i uh we were covering uh, the U of C uh, versus our prospects game, and he stood out in that one. So he okay, was here so... at one point, but uh, okay. yeah, he then vanished shortly thereafter, never to be heard from again. Never came over to North America to play, always stayed in Russia, and yeah, that was pretty much the only thing. Um, and then two defensemen, um, Nikita Nesterov, who played 38 games last year for the Flames, and Alexei, or Al- Alexander Yelison who was brought over from Russia and despite playing really well for Stockton, um, just had four NHL games in 2019, 2020, and then went back. I never felt that Yellison was going to work out. I don't know why. It just, I felt like he was always one of those guys who just wanted to go back to Europe. I think he was kind of NHL or bust. Yeah. And well, Yellison played well enough where like if Calgary was a bottom feeder team, he probably would have stuck in the lineup all season. But because Calgary had some depth, that he, it just wasn't necessary, and it just didn't turn out. But, you know, flame shot their shot, it just didn't connect. Germany has two former flames. Uh, Tobias Reeder is over there, who I thought, you know, for what he was on the team, Tobias Reeder I thought was a good flame. And Wolf Castle McBain, one of my most memorable flames, David Wolf is over there. Oh, good, the skating refrigerator. He, he looked like Wolf Castle McBain from The Simpsons. For those that haven't seen him, look him up. He's like Wolf Castle McBain on ice. Yeah, uh, he is an absolutely massive person. Uh, he, he did play three NHL games. He was okay in the AHL, but he was, I thought, why import a bruiser? It, he played well enough that he actually made the NHL, and, you know, he did. Uh, come into a couple playoff games if i recall correctly as well so you know he didn't look good in those playoff games but yeah who is that not that he, uh, i'll wait till after this list and i'll ask you um switzerland has two former flames rafael diaz who i forgot was a flame yeah and red obara the i think the defenseman or the goaltender now that we all know for doing the karate moves after the shootout that's pretty much the only reason people still remember him i uh, know that was henrik carlson was that? Yeah. Uh, Red Obara, he was just uh, a, a huge goalie, and he did okay. good in the shootout uh, once. But I, I'm, I'm getting my generic throwaway backups confused. Yeah. He, he was the guy that we got a second-round pick for. Okay. So and we got some value in, out of him. That turned into Hunter Smith, which was – yeah. We got nothing for him. Uh, <laughs> Going back to our drafting. Yeah. Um, there, there's, a, there's a reason why Calgary has struggled throughout their franchise history. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. 
Um, Slovakia has Milos Roman, who you and I talked to, I think, at one rookie camp. Yeah. Um, I always thought marginal player that now plays in the Czech League. We'll probably never see him back in North America. Yeah, unless uh, he, like, takes a major step forward and is, like, leading the Czech League in scoring, then he might sign back over in North America. But, you know, it, it's one of those he has to become, like, an elite player in the Czech League just to get any interest over here. Well, and even then, I mean, he's got to be, like, 24, 20. He's t- okay, he's 22. I thought he was a little older than that. But, um, I mean, by the time he would get to that point, he'd be 24, 25. And a lot of those guys, how often have you seen a guy that come over for a year, do marginal in the NHL, and then just go back to the Czech League? That rarely works out long Um, Trevenka? <laughs> yeah. That's the guy I was thinking of, Roman Trevenka, the guy they brought over couldn't speak good English, and they didn't really know what to do with him. Yeah. It's like, and um, participation trophy. Speaking of participation trophies, also in Slovakia, Marek Rivik, who... Oh, yeah, the, uh, the former uh, New York Ranger guy. Yeah, I had, I had to look him up. I'm like, he played for the Flames? Yeah. He played in three games here after suffering a whole bunch of injuries. Yeah, very briefly, war number 51, because um, that is and, important, apparently. And speaking of Roman Trevenka, he is in the Olympics. He'll be playing uh, alongside another former flame, Michael Frolik, for uh, Czechia, or what used to be the Czech Republic. Um, I would say, you know, of this list, I'd say Frolik probably the most prolific flame on this list. Yeah, uh, and probably one of the more prolific players in the whole tournament. <laughs> to probably, be honest, I mean, like it, it's really Eric Stahl and him. And then uh, a bunch of me- mediocres. And I mean, Michael Frolik was, he was part of that 3M line for a season that looked good. And then he started to really fall off. He was traded partway through 2020 for the pick that would become Daniel Chechelev, who's now in the Swedish A-League. And I think that's a goaltender that actually has some promise for the Flames. Yep. Do I think he's Dustin Wolf level? No, but I think he's got some promise for the Flames. Well, and that's the thing that I've harped on for years with their uh, drafting is like keep adding a goalie every year and until you get like a Kipper level guy, because you just never know who. Like Wolf could just all of a sudden start struggling and evaporate. We thought that Parsons you know. was going to be good. We thought that McDonald was going to be good. Yeah, uh, Gillies. Uh, you know, like. Even Schneider looked good in brief snippets, and you know, and like they just don't turn out. But you just have to keep going until you get a good one, and sometimes you even have to poach them from other teams, like the Flames did with Vladar or Kippersoff. Yeah, true. Um, and then Roman Trevanko, we mentioned this was a Jay Feaster hire. I think Jay Feaster was touting this guy as the next great NHLer. He played 39 uh, games, got nine goals, and he'd never be seen in the NHL again. And frankly, like I think he could have continued to play in the NHL if he wanted to, um, as like a decent ish like middle six forward. On- I think he probably had the chance to either be a middle six guy or go home and probably be higher up on the lineup. And that's exactly it. Like I think he would rather be like the European League All Star instead of just a guy in the lineup and like frankly his attitude wasn't very great either like uh attitude wise he seemed more like an alexei kovalev like i'm just too good for this kind of stuff but yeah it's it is what it is so 21 former flames already announced there's one no flame so far in denmark or latvia that could change there could be more if taxi squads are announced there's one other guy so far who might make it, and that's to the Team China roster. Spencer Fu is uh, apparently on the short list for Team China, but they haven't announced that roster yet. Which makes entire sense because he's a hockey player that played NHL games who's going to play for China. Well, I think he was so. also, he played for the Chinese Red Star team in the KHL for a while, so I wouldn't be surprised if he had some sort of Chinese citizenship, Chinese work visa, whatever he might have to do that. Yeah, for sure. I think he actually left the Flames to go play over there. Yeah, he did. Uh, actually, I do believe the Flames still actually hold his rights, believe it or not. I'd have to go check. I'm not sure. Yeah, because I think he left even though... Uh, That's how you know you don't have enough prospects when you're still holding his rights and it's not interfering with you bringing in new prospects. No. Well, we still... You only have we, 80, 
80 total rights under the shortlist. Well, like, they still have the rights to Rafikov, too, and he's, like, what, 28, 29 now or something like that? At some point, you just walk away from those. Maybe one day somebody will want him. Either that or someone just forgot they have the rights. Like, yeah, sure, why not keep it? Fine, who cares? <laughs> so, 21 former Flames in the going to the Olympics so far could be more. Um, Matt, when you're sort of looking around at these rosters and you're hearing these names, is there any one team that sticks out to you so far as being the team to beat? Uh, not really. Um, they all kind of suck at various levels. Um, I guess like the more named countries like Canada, US, Finland, Sweden, Russia would be more likely to make damage here. Not Latvia for the win? No. Like, it, honestly, with the, this roster, it's not very far off of what Latvia is. Could Latvia get a medal? Sure. Do you think we'll see, and, and we can talk about this as we get close to the Olympics as well, but do you see anybody who might get a second lease on the NHL out of this? Is there anybody you think is going to maybe light things up and the NHL teams are going to be, oh, we got to take another look at that guy? Do you think Stahl gets back in the NHL or Froley gets back in well, the NHL? Uh, Stahl specifically, I think, yes. Uh, just because I think he went there, like, didn't sign a contract specifically so he could go to the Olympics. And, you know, I think that was, like, his whole mission was just, I'm going to the Olympics and, yeah, figure it out from there. And, you know, it's worked out for him. But I, I think that he will find somebody because he didn't play poorly last year. That's true. Well, that's all we have for the Flames uh, for this week. So it's almost time for us to do our predictions, but we want to give a little bit of a programming note for everybody listening. We're going to be changing our recording schedule. Just like the NHL had some scheduling changes, so are we. Only for the month of February, we're going to be moving our recordings from Wednesday to Sunday, which means the show should be released on Mondays. So starting next week, which would be uh, January 30th, we'll be recording on Sunday, and that'll continue February 6th, February 13th, February 20th, and February 27th. And then uh, going back into... Um, actually, we may not do that. Yeah, we'll probably do the 27th as well, and then going back into March, we will continue back on uh, on the Wednesdays. So for starting next week, you're going to get to hear us twice in a seven-day span, technically, most of you if you listen right away um and you can expect for the next month that we'll be recording on sundays just to accommodate the best day for us where there's no nhl game so matt with the sunday recording that gives us three games to look ahead to last week we predicted how the flames were doing two uh we both had wins for both games edmonton and st louis and neither of us got it right we split those decisions one st louis lost edmonton Three games until we talk on Sunday. The Flames go on a short road trip. Tuesday, they're in Columbus, a 5 p.m. start time. Back-to-back -back on, or sorry, Wednesday, they're in Columbus. Um, early start time, 5 p.m. Thursday, they're in St. Louis, a 6 p.m. start time on a back-to-back. -back. And then Sunday, they're back here, or Saturday, they're back here at the Saldome for an 8 p.m. start time against the Vancouver Canucks. Three games, two on the road. What's your prediction for the week, Matt? Um, well, frankly, they need to beat the bad teams, and I don't think they'll beat St. Louis, so I'll go 2-1. and one. So you think they're going to win against Columbus? And Vancouver, and lose to St. Louis. Interesting. And where do you think we see Dan Vladar, if at all, this week? Um, probably the St. Louis game. See, and I, I was thinking about that. Do you put him in there, or do you put him in in Columbus and then put Markstrom in to sort of avenge the, you know, keep them in the game against St. Louis? Uh, it depends on what your priority is. Like, if you're just wanting to make sure that you get points, uh, Markstrom against Columbus, I think, makes more sense. But, um, yeah, it's one of those... Uh, frankly, for how little they've played lately, I wouldn't even be surprised if Markstrom played both. Both back to backs. Yeah. And and Vancouver. Yeah. Just because like they they there have been so few games that you know like it, it, he they're all well rested, you know like that that before the Edmonton game they had a three day break and then they had a break before that 
so like they they've got plenty of gas in the tank. So. And they've got what well, one two, two days after that. Yeah. I'm gonna go a little bit differently than you. I think that we're gonna win in St. Louis, and I think we're gonna beat Vancouver. I think the Flames might go into Columbus a little bit too cocky after the seven-one win. And we often see that not working well for them. So I'm going to say that we win St. Louis, Vancouver. We lose Columbus. Makes sense. But I think as we often, as we say pretty much every week, they've, I think, well, you can't go 500 in a, in a three game week. I guess technically you could, but I think you need two wins somewhere for this to be a successful week. Well, especially like with the objective of catching Vegas, like they've got five games on hand on the Knights and are eight points back so they need to be racking up some w's uh, over the next little bit to try and erase that deficit for sure and we'll see the knights on the ninth so i mean we could we could put up a lot of points we're almost fighting for the top by then yeah exactly all right well matt i guess uh that pretty much ends things for the week for us so again i remember scheduling change now we'll talk to you next monday yep and uh as always, go Flames, go. And thankfully, it's going to be a lot more games coming up to talk about. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.